By the light of the Christ candle, we see the differences which can divide may also unite. Here we confess that we are all one in Christ. Here in this fifth Sunday of Easter, all are welcome to find and take their place. This morning, we have as our guest speaker, Reverend Charles DeGradius, and uh, yesterday we had the Conference of Men of Maritime Provinces uh, in the United Church, and Charles was our guest speaker. And you've seen these signs, heart prints, and advertisements going on here for the last little while, and I can assure you, there, I believe there was 110 men here yesterday, and Charles left a heart print on each and each and every one of you. And by way of introduction, I'm going to keep it very brief because uh, it, it's important that Charles gets as much time to, to uh, tell you his story. But uh, he currently lives in, in uh, Gagetown, Fre Greater Fredericton area. Uh, he's, he's married. His, his wife, uh, he was telling me, was born in the same refugee camp he was. And Charles' mother was a midwife. And uh, we were chatting here, and he said, well, his wife's mother lived next door. Well, not really, he said, lived by the next bush. And uh, Charles' mother delivered his wife at, at birth, uh, which, which is a special thing. And, and as we heard yesterday, Charles' mother had a, had a huge impact on him. Currently, they have two children, one at UNB, I say hooray for you, MD, and, and the other at St. Thomas. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll leave the service to, uh, to Charles and Nigel and, and urge you all to, uh, to, to welcome Charles to our midst today. Thank you. Let's stand and sing together. plants pushing through soil, cold, hard, and resistant. With pussy willows budding in watery ditches. With wild birds collecting the cast off and windblown. With the rest of creation, Awakening to springtime. I invite you to turn to 154 in the paperback hymn book.
may be seated. I invite us now to join together in the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. Forgive us, God, in times when we think that you do not know and you do not care, in moments when we forget that you delight in us, for the ways we make others feel bad so that we can feel good, for the ways we act like we're the only ones who matter, because we're not sure that we really do. May we come to see and believe ourselves to be loved, precious, and good. May we believe that about others and see them that way too. Amen. Jesus stood among them and said, I think he said it a little more with a bit more oomph than that, okay? Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he breathed on them and said, the Holy If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do The peace of Christ be with you. The first reading for today is from the second chapter of Ruth. A quick reminder of what happens in the first chapter of Ruth. Naomi and her husband Elimelech, who live in Bethlehem, leave Bethlehem in a time of famine and journey to Moab. There in Moab, their two sons marry Moabite women. While they're there, Elimelech dies, and Naomi is widowed. And then each of her sons dies, so that Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws are widowed. Naomi decides to return to her home in Bethlehem. And one of her daughters, Ruth, goes with her. And this is what happens next. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech. His name was Boaz, and he was well-to-do. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the fields and be a gleaner, gathering the leftover grain behind anyone who will take pity on me. Naomi said, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth went out to the fields to follow the harvesters and gathered the grain that they dropped. As Providence would have it, she came to the part of the field that was owned by Boaz of Elimelech's clan. It so happened that Boaz had just returned from Bethlehem. He greeted the harvesters by calling out, The Lord be with you. They shouted back, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz turned to the supervisor in charge of the harvesters and asked, Who does that woman work for? The supervisor of the harvesters replied, She is the Moabite, who returned from the land of Moab with Naomi. She asked our permission to collect the grain that the workers dropped. She's been working steadily since early morning, with scarcely any rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen to my words, my child, and accept my offer. Don't collect your grain in anyone else's fields but mine. And don't leave here. Stay with my women binding the grain. Watch them closely, and whatever part of the field they are harvesting, follow the behind them. I have all ordered all my men reaping not to bother you. When you get thirsty, go to the water jars they bring with them, and get a drink of water. Ruth bowed down to the ground and said to Boaz, How have I come to deserve your favor so much that you take care of me? I'm just a foreigner. Boaz replied, I have heard how you have cared for your mother-in-law since your husband died, and how you left your own family and the land where you were born to come and live here among strangers. 
May the Lord pay you in full for your loyalty. May you be richly rewarded by the Most High God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to find shelter. Ruth said, May you find me deserving of your kindness. You have treated me gently and given me solace, even though I am not one of your workers. When noontime arrived, Boaz said to her, Come here and share my bread and dip some of it in the wine. Ruth sat with the rest of the workers while Boaz prepared a bowl of roasted barley as a snack. She ate until she was no longer hungry and still had some left over. Then she got up to continue her gathering. Boaz ordered his women binders, let her pick from among the bundles you have gathered and do not hinder her. In fact, go so far as to drop some grain from your bundles and let her collect it without fear. Ruth continued to gather in the field until evening. Then she winnowed what she had collected and had enough grain to fill a whole basket. I mean, I, I don't know. You, do you clap in here? <laughs> oh, that was amazing. It's beautiful, isn't it? What a privilege it is to be here, Reverend Weber. I, they pron- I can't pronounce your name either. Dio gracias, can you? Weber or Weaver? <laughs> what a privilege it is. What a great uh, privilege to be with you and you ladies and gentlemen to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this day. I will tell the story I told here yesterday, uh, so just for the sake of this, uh, this, this introduction and the beginning of this in- incredible encounter together this morning. I uh, built 19, over 19 years ago, I was a student in Knox College, and, and maybe, mind you, I haven't been in Canada forever, it's just 22 years, I'm just beginning to enjoy it. 
But 19 years, over 19 years ago, I was preaching at Knox College, a student at Knox College, and so I was invited to preach at Richmond Hill Presbyterian Church in Ontario. And so I was, uh, as I was doing the sermon, after the sermon, you know, when you finish the sermon, you go out the door, you know, and everybody lies to you. They tell you you're good, and you, so you think you are. <laughs> the humdrum of life, of well done job, blah, blah. It's all great. But anyway, this young lady, about 70 years old, comes to me and she said, Charles, you know, I, I think you are someone who was good. But you see, I have a hard time of hearing. And your Scotch accent didn't do it today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I actually did. I laughed. She actually sincerely thought I was from Scotland. And I can't make no mistake, there are few black dudes in Scotland. I, I don't know about you. Let me hope this morning there will be no hindrances. So it could be my Scottish accent, my African accent, all inclusive. Let us pray, shall we? Let us pray. Lord, you are so blessed to be in your presence and in the presence of one another. What a privilege it is indeed to be here this morning. I pray that you speak to us so there may be no barriers, not of our language, because the language of Jesus is the language of love. May we hear that from our hearts, from the gospel, from the good news that you have brought to us through Jesus Christ. So be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I get, I get that, I gather there are no preachers who ever come to preach and they stand in the pulpit and they brag about their names. If you don't know, my name is Deo Gratias. <laughs> it's actually true. So I'm here to brag about my name. Stay tuned. <laughs> Maybe it's not true, isn't it? Because this is not really my name. Deo Gratias for Canada. Thanks to God for Canada. One of the greatest uh, uh, novelists, uh, an, an original novelist, was speaking to the, to the bunch of immigrants in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in 1919, 1911. And while he was speaking to them, he, he kind of noted his own, his own despair. He actually denoted and noted that just one of the worst things of being an immigrant or a refugee is this loss of belonging that you become a stranger, a stranger to the people you forsook, and stranger to the people you have come to. You are always in some type of limbo, not sure. Ladies and gentlemen, those of us who have walked through uh, and have come through the, either the push the doors or invited, sometimes it feels like if you have been an immigrant or a stranger in some way, you would understand. And I will tell you that I, I do. But what I do most to know, if, before even we come to the book of Ruth, is this incredible, I don't know about you, I don't know about you, that you had a chance when you wake up in the morning and then somebody tells you that you have nowhere, to, there's nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Now you have heard my story, I was a refugee, I was a refugee, I was a refugee. I'm no longer a refugee, eh? I may act like one, but I'm not. I'm telling the Canadian, it's really incredible, I'm here a little bit this morning. But, but from the jungles of Africa, I have had the privilege. Savings have come to my door, and I have left the refugee. Uh, you know, I hope people wrote, read a little bit because we were refugees. Our parents kicked out of Rwanda in 1959, and my wife and I were born in the refugee camp in Tanzania in a place of despair and hopelessness. But I had left it. But I'm always a refugee. I have no country. But have, somehow, though, God did the miracles. And I travel from Africa, and I live away from the jungle, and I go and I 
just land in the United States, in Colorado. I go to the university. I finish the university, and I go to the seminary, and I think I have achieved all I can achieve. By the end, I started the university when I was 23. I started to read when I was 21, reading English for the first time. I learned how to read at all when I was 17. But at the age of 29, I had a Master's of Divinity, Bachelor's of Arts, and social science, and then masters of divinity, ladies and gentlemen. That's how the God has gifted me. So I am done. If, you, if you're in America, you say I have achieved a little bit of an American dream. If you're Canadian, you're still learning. It's actually fantastic. On the pinnacle of my sort of achievement, my wife my, was my bride. Uh, we, this time, genocide is rooming in my country. In Rwanda, people are being kidnapped in Kenya, in Tanzania, in, in Uganda. You couldn't go nowhere. They are being killed. It's 1993, but 94 is coming because April 94, this 22 years ago, this, this, this month, uh, people were butchered like animals. They butchered each other. Almost a million people were killed. So my visa is almost ending. I have no student visa. The church I'm about saying, I'm with, is saying, well, we're going to help you, Charles, maybe find your papers and all that. Well, shortly after my wife, my fiance arrives, and so I receive this news saying, well, sorry, uh, if you got to leave the United States, or you would be deported. We get married, I look at my wife, and I say, deported, but I guess I got to marry you. For better or for worse. By the way, if you know what that means. <laughs> for better or for worse. So we get married. The church organized two weeks, whatever. We get married. We do this. You know, have you ever woken up? And now, don't be carried away. Even though my wife from the, is a girl from the next bush, you heard. It's true. I still had to explain to her that, honey, we have nowhere to go. I don't know where we're going. I, we have no country. Ladies and gentlemen, for again, we were reminded we had no country, nowhere to go. Where do you go? Everybody tells their bride, we're going for a honeymoon. And you tell her, you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're going. This incredible moment in which you are reminded again it's not over. It's not over. You have no country. No country. Ladies and gentlemen, I looked at and I said, let's, let's think. I heard, I heard, there's a place. There's a place called North. I mean, we're in Denver. That I hear that they accept people sometime. <laughs> and people like us who have nowhere to go, sometimes they accept us. Ladies and gentlemen, we take a bus from Denver, Colorado to Detroit near Windsor. Like Ruth. Ruth wakes up in the morning. You know, by the way, the book is so deep. The book is so deep in the past. Thank you for reading a little bit at the beginning. You've got to read it. But let me just paint the picture for you differently. It's almost like for the first time there is no food in Canada, there is food in Syria. And you are going to Syria to look for food. Because from Israel, to go to Moab, it's just like you just lost everything you are. So, the family of Naomi in, in Syria or in Moab, they are looking for food, for hope. There is no food in Israel for the first time. They arrived there, the story you heard the family is destroyed. Everything's done, but for better or for worse, Naomi. By the way, Ruth comes back 
the mother, she becomes the daughter-in-law, she comes back with the name. It's a good story to read when you have a chance. It's absolutely wonderful. There is only one word that comes out of this book all through that appears in the book. Don't miss it. When you read it, you find it. It's called, in Hebrew, it's called chesed. Chesed. Chesed means faithfulness, compassion, kindness, loving. It's all of that. And this morning is what I want to say. This is what Canada is to me. When you use the word chesed, compassion, kindness, faithful, loving, inviting, welcoming, hospitable. And all of this is chesed. Chesed. Ruth says to Naomi, where you die, I will die. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so this moment, she begins to wake up to fulfill her obligations. And so chapter 2, she says, let me go. Let me go somewhere to someone where in somebody in whose eyes I might find favor. Someone, ladies and gentlemen, my wife and I are waking up, uh, drive, taking a bus to somewhere we do not know, and we are crossing the border we have never crossed in our lives, and we're looking for someone who would, who would, who would overlook. Notice if you are a Ruth. You are a woman, you are a stranger, you are a stranger to be, you are a mobite, a mobite woman to be, you are a stranger to be watched carefully. You are poor. But somehow you hope there is someone in whose eyes you, you will find a favor. Someone who will overlook your, in our case, our poverty, our uh, whatever, our origin, our blackness, our <laughs> everything. And someone would say, it's okay. Someone who would show compassion. And heading north, we have this feeling. As this feeling. So, ladies and gentlemen, what Boaz did to Ruth, Canada does it for us. As we arrive, my wife didn't speak a word of English. By the way, if you meet her, she, you, hopefully you will. I'll bring her next time I come to visit here. I told some people that I come to buy wine, but I'm coming to preach. <laughs> <laughs> it's a port you buy in this town. It's nowhere else. It's true. <laughs> My wife didn't speak a word of English. I mumble jumbled some. So she now has master's degree. So you talk to her when she comes. And I walk in front of her and I walk to the immigration officer at Windsor, Ontario. And I said, we are beginning those long eulogies and said, we are refugees, we are whatever. And I begin to say these words. And she looks at me, this immigration officer lady, and she says, she says, and I, keep this really hard, it's hard, but I must say it. She says, welcome in, welcome in, and have a seat. And then the officer will come and listen to your story. Have you ever studied psychology? It was called a psychological paradigm shift in my psychic. Somebody says, welcome in, and have a seat. When you're hanging on a cliff and you're about to drop, you're not sure if someone will say, we've seen many of you. Sorry. And someone says, welcome. In. Ladies and gentlemen, I want it to know. <laughs> the rest is history, so do not get me going. <laughs> what Canada means to us is welcome. In. Welcome. In. It's okay.
you know what? It, because I'm struggling, I am to tell you the humor about this. After we are welcomed in, the officers talk to us, and then they saw us the door to come to Canada. So the, the lady says, no, now you can go anywhere in Canada. And I looked at her and I said, where is anywhere in Canada? <laughs> where is anywhere? And she said, oh, 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 oh. She picks up this list of shelter homes and she begins to read. The first one on the top was the Brotia House in Toronto. And I said, oh, good, Toronto. I heard about Toronto. Oh, she said, okay. So she calls through this shelter home for us. And this shelter home, Brotia House is just off uh, Queen, Ave, uh, Queen Street and Humbley Avenue. And uh, there we were, he accepted us in this Roman Catholic shelter home where we stayed for three months. We spent our Christmas in 1993. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now, now found favor, haven't we? We have found favor. You see, is the first thing, and I want you to keep, keep this because of the interest of the time. Canada did not only give us a country at this moment, but it gave us friends. It's true. As during my time in the shelter home, I looked in the book, phone books, the first church that comes, there was the Thornhill Presbyterian Church. So I pick up a phone, and I said, you people pick up, People for, for, for church. The Reverend uh, Helen Smith says, no. <laughs> no, we don't pick up people for church. But, <laughs> but if you would like an, a ride, we may arrange it. And I say, would you arrange it, please? I don't want to go too long. Ladies and gentlemen, we are finding favor on me. The church welcomes us, uh, and so the rest is history. I was ordained 19 years ago at Thornhill Presbyterian Church and pastored f before I became a chaplain 16 years ago. Look at the first point. Naomi and Ruth are in this state, but Ruth is, is on the business. She has found someone in the land. She has somehow surprised herself. She lands in the land. Naomi mentioned somewhere this name, but she doesn't know it because Boaz hasn't come. But she comes now in finding someone whose eyes she finds favor. And look, I want you to see whether the foreman and the Boaz comes also very quickly, the first point for the sake of this service is he gives her or they give her permission permission a permission someone gives you permission and i don't want to repeat it permit you don't know how it feels when you are on the edge you're on a crossroad and somebody welcomes in by the way i want you to know if god ever said the charles you're going to have a honeymoon you're going to have a honeymoon in canada do you think i would say god you are crazy i want you to know uh, <laughs> Our honeymoon in the shelter made a baby, it's true, actually. <laughs> if God ever negotiated with us and gave us something we never, never regret, he sent us to Canada. And the door was open, the permission was given, so here we are. Here we are. What a privilege. Dio gracias for Canada. Literally. Literally, thanks to God for the privilege of being permitted to enter into this country with such, these incredible words. Welcome in, welcome in. If we give anything back to this country, it's because it has given us so much we can never put in the human words. My wife and I joined the military together. She's a master corporal right now, actually pending to commission because she has master's degree from Royal Rose University in Victoria in human security and peace building. 
We said we are ready to die for this country if need may be, and for sure, two times in Afghanistan, my life could have, could have just been snatched like that, like everyone else. We're all for something that would count for a long time, while I could have died in the refugee camp for nothing. Permission. What a privilege. What a privilege. Secondly, when not only did the Boaz give Naomi a Ruth a permission to glen, to harvest, to, to, to take food. In fact, during this time, he says, you know, I, I, not, not only do I let you harvest behind the, the, these workers, not, not only do you do it, I will actually invite you, do not go anywhere else. Don't go to another country. You would be surprised this is the best place in the world to be. Well, you want to tell me about that? I don't know if you know that. This is the best place in the world to be. It is. It's beautiful to be in Canada. It really is. You know, today I just made new friends, you, all of you. It's beautiful to have friends. It's been such a priceless, it's just been such a gift. He said, compassion, kindness, loving, goodness, all inclusive will be stored upon us as if we deserve it. And I know, and I will, you know, this what Ruth said, my Lord, and she bows down and she falls like, do I deserve this? Like you're treating me as if I am one of your own. Look, I haven't changed, since I arrived in this church, I haven't changed the color, but I feel so much loved. <laughs> in other words, uh, you know, hopefully you're enjoying because I am enjoying it this morning, to just to be with you. We get a sense of this incredible moment when you have such an incredible joy given to you, not just because the people you have come to now, but also the beauty of knowing that actually this is in the heart of human spirit. Love. Don't go anywhere. I promise you, even if I go back to Africa, I will come back a million times here. I will. I have to. I have to. I have to keep on giving and celebrating and loving and serving in this country with joy. The second thing Nay Ruth receives Boaz, gives to, to Ruth what Canada has given to us. He gives her a protection, ladies and gentlemen, don't miss it, in the scripture. He gives her protection. He looks at her, he says, no, don't go anywhere. In fact, stay put, stay still, stay just closer to the, behind the girls. Right there behind the girls, as you pick your food, I have told the boys not to touch you. Now, I don't know if the boys were a little abused. Don't ask me. But they better, they did, they better know they're, they're done if they touch her. Ladies and gentlemen, he gives her protection. When you're an immigrant, you are kind of floating. You don't know the language. You're trying to fit in. You're trying to kind of make sense. You're a woman. You are black for that matter. You are whatever, even though I, I tell people everywhere I go, I know I'm black if I look at my hands, but <laughs> I don't look in the mirror too much because I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> You need a protection. And, and, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing else beautiful. When Canada, what Canada has given us, incredible protection from the monsters that will still snatch our lives like that. If I had gone back to Tanzania or to, to Kenya, or there's no chance, 90, 93 of their kidnapping, I would have survived. Remember, we arrived in December of 93 in Canada. 94 in April, 22 years ago, people were being killed like animals. 
our people are being butchered. You think it's hard to put any words for anyone. Protection was afforded us and it would be for a long, long time. You know, I want you to know, not only me and many others I have listened not too long ago, I accompanied the Canadian soldiers and veterans to Holland. They, we were celebrating about five, six, seven years ago, we were pre- uh, celebrating 65 of the liberation of the Netherlands. 65 years of the liberation of the Netherlands. I was the padre designated to say prayer at every cemetery where Canadian men and women were buried. And I was with the Queen of Holland and others and the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Canada had come. But as we arrived, the, ho- the Dutch people were lined up, were just lined up everywhere we walked. It's true, even me, and I thought they would think, you know, what this black dude, what's he doing? I mean, surely I wasn't there in 1945. <laughs> I mean, they were kissing our, our hands. Now, um, I want you to know, it was actually fantastic to see you feel like a Pope. They were kissing, they said, thank you, thank you for, thank you for, for thank you so much for protecting our country. And they were worshipping literary Canadians. I witness this moment. Now I'm saying, wow, it's so nice to know. It's good to be in Canada, isn't it? And it is. Because there we could feel the sense of what Canada has given, not just those of us who have come through the doors, but just through the, the borders. Those they found in their countries, they preserved their countries. When Canada, ladies and gentlemen, offers a status or any or citizenship, he offers more than that. He offers hope and dreams. He offers really, you begin to dream dreams that will come true. At least you begin to feel free for the first time. When my wife and I arrived, we realized, we, we looked through the window and in this basement where we had just come from the shelter home and, and this, and so we said, you know, Canada can be, we can look at it through the window out there and really never go out there. Or we can walk through these stairs and go out the door and meet everybody who ever existed and do whatever it takes. Now that is to say for my wife, she said, I got to run the English, I got to speak English, I got to do it. Because I hear the sky is the limit. You know, we lived this experience in short. Let me run quickly. We lived this experience. Ten years later, my wife went to the University of Windsor. This is where she did her bachelor's in, in accounting and finance. And she did, when she went to the University of Windsor, she had finished Georgian College in Berry for three years of accounting, and then we went to Windsor. But then we went to relive the experience. So you don't know, if you've ever been to Windsor, you don't know where the immigration, the university is, you should go, it's really interesting. It's just right here, and here's immigration is the university. So you, <laughs> you walk in the, so we come and went, went by the immigration, we walked a little bit, and then I just said to her, I said, to her, I said we got to, we got to look a little tall. I, we just remember all the time we think we're short. I, I, I think I'm, I'm short back home, actually. But we, let's look tall and walk because we are no longer refugees. We are actually Canadians. Now you are walking in the halls of the University of Windsor. to achieve your dreams, your dreams. Only here, people achieve their dreams because they are protected. You are given more than protection. You are given hope, hope, hope. If we give it any time, whether in this service or anywhere else, it's because we have received it, ladies and gentlemen. Third, Boaz did not only give Ruth permission to glen and harvest, he did not only give her protection, but also he gives her provision. Provision. Did you hear the scripture? First, he says, when when you are thirsty, 
the boys have fetched water, you go there and drink some water. And then following that, after that, she's still flabbergasted, she doesn't know what to do. Still beside her, look at you, you see me, I'm still crazy, I don't know what to do. You think I do? I'm, I'm ready to fly, I don't know. You know, I don't know, I want to hug Canada from it. By the way, I have been in Newfoundland too. <laughs> I have. I've preached in Newfoundland, actually. It's just terrible. You know, you know she's still beside herself, said, my Lord. Like, remember, I'm not one of your people. Like, why do you love me so much? Why do you... Why? We fetched water. It took two hours. It took two hours. So you go to, to the river to fetch water for two hours with a bucket, and two hours you come back for anyone to have water to drink. And that was normal. Water was just like a life. And we didn't have enough. We are always dehydrated and thirsty. I don't know, I know what Boaz was giving Ruth. But most of all, notice what did, she, what did he say? Come. Come, come for lunch. Come for lunch. Come for lunch. Come break the bread. Come for lunch. Have you ever invited someone for lunch who was hungry? And really, in fact, by the way, if people are hungry, they don't eat much, a lot. I know it's taken me so long. Now I eat five plates, but when I first arrived here, <laughs> I ate a little bit because I was trying to get used to the roast beef. I love it so much. Come for lunch. When we arrived in this country, sorry, pastor, what's that? <laughs> I don't here to break this church. I'm here to, to build the spirit. Don't touch me. <laughs> I won't go too far there again. Well, when we arrived in this country, Canada did not only give us permission, protection, it gave us provision. And they gave us from the shelter home what I call, Canada gave us a hand up, not a handout. They gave us social assistance, and there we are. One an year and a half, we were on social assistance in this little basement where our daughter was born, and there we were with such incredible care and love you can never put in the human words. That is an gentleman. What a privilege that is. Come for lunch. When you're, uh, you have nowhere, one day you have nowhere to go, and the next day, here you are, lavished with all the blessings heavens would give, just because you have walked in our case in Canada. For Ruth, just because she has walked on the farm on the land of Boers, and really the benefit would come, get ready. What a privilege that is. My Lord, why have you treated us? Canada, why have you treated us and welcomed us as if we have always lived here? Why have you treated us and welcomed us? Why have you opened the doors when others say close the borders? Chesed. Chesed. Somehow you know that I want you to know that this country has always been greater and even greater and greater when it has opened its doors to the strangers. And here we are. You know, Naomi would say, Ruth would say, or Boaz would say, yeah, yeah, you know when she says, 
why you do you treat me? She said, you know, I heard how you cared so much for your, your mother-in-law. I, I heard. But for us, Canada would say, I heard and I saw your pain and your hopelessness and, and your, the brutality in your country. And I'll say, welcome in, welcome in. May God bless you so much today and continue to and so in your homes and in your hearts and in your country and in your church may strangers continue to find favor and may they continue to be feel this sense like I do this morning like I have across this country as even as I they stood with even with the soldiers in the front line Ladies and gentlemen, may God give you his goodness and shower you, as we all say together, Dio gracias for Canada, one of the best gifts ever given to those of us who are, have endured despair and lived with no hope, but then find it when we land in this place. I want you to know that we thank God for you. We thank God for this country, and many of you can tell me you know your grandparents and others come from somewhere else, it's true, but it feels beautiful, isn't it? It feels beautiful. So the blessings of God, the love of God that surpasses every, every understanding, continue to be with you. The God whom we have come to find even here and the love we have experienced, may the same love come back to you as well. And hopefully for the little bit we stay with you, we give this back to you as well. It's not enough. It's not enough. And my wife and I every day to do this as we wake up and say the gracias of Canada, we want there where do we go next? To continue to serve this country and do it to the best of our ability until life says otherwise. Until life says otherwise. I have no words more to say. What a British. Thank you, and thank you so much, and God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Loving God, you ask us to be still, to be still and to know, to be still and to know that you are God. That you love us with a womb love stronger than the love of any mother for her child. In the face of that love, help us to be loving. In the face of that love, Help us to know that all are loved. Help us so to be still that we would know the truth of Charles' story, the truth of our own story the truth of the stories of others. In that stillness, help us to know and to realize all that we take for granted, all that is simply there, and we accept as ours without any thought 
without any thankfulness. Help us to be all that you intend humanity to be. Help us to see in one another your image and the Christ, love incarnate, love made blood and bone, sinew, muscle, and flesh. So indeed, may the Christ be embedded and embodied in us and in this country of which we are a part, in this world to which we all belong. For these things we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.